and welcome to the LLG Grapevine podcast. You're listening this week to Dennis Hall, LLG Bulletin Editor. The latest political gyrations and economic uncertainty, combined with the absence of clear leadership, is still bad news for our sector. Local government needs a proper financial settlement that meets the pressures and demands that are placed upon it. Governance and sound administrative practice and the roles of our members are all put under immense stress when service delivery is underfunded and inadequate. We see more interventions, more maladministration, more reports and notices concerning financial and governance failures. The forthcoming budgetary announcements are yet another opportunity for the government to redress the imbalances that currently imperil the delivery of local government services. Let me begin with the latest annual report from the local government ombudsman. It's entitled, Complaints about English Social Care Increasingly Due to Funding Constraints. The key takeaways are these. The cost of providing care has become an increasingly common theme in the complaints made to the local government and social care ombudsman. The report said that they are seeing more cases where councils are failing to provide care or are limiting care while using cost as the justification. Local government ombudsman Michael King said, the issues we're investigating are neither new nor surprising, but do indicate a system with a growing disconnect between the care to which people are entitled and the ability of councils to meet those needs. He said care assessments, care planning and charging for care have been key features of our cases this year And a common theme is that councils are failing to provide care or limiting it and justifying these decisions because of the cost. We appreciate, he says, that budgets are becoming increasingly stretched, but authorities' duties under the Care Act remain, and we will continue to hold authorities to account for what they should be doing rather than what they say they can afford to do. Over the past year, The Ombudsman has upheld 70% of the cases it has investigated about adult social care, a figure higher than the 66% average uphold rate across all areas it investigates. However, since the last comparable year before the pandemic, the Ombudsman has received 16% fewer complaints about adult care as a whole. And on this point, Mr King added, I'm also concerned that more than a decade of rising demand and unmet need have left service users and their families disillusioned and feeling there is no point in making a complaint. Now, I have some wider questions in relation to all of this about the role of monitoring officers in dealing with maladministration and corporate complaints. Indeed, what is their role in these cases? And by that, I don't just mean what does the law say, but to what extent on a day-to-day basis do they get involved in the maladministration and corporate complaint issues that their councils are involved in. This is an area where monitoring officers may wish to review their effectiveness and influence on corporate and departmental decision making, particularly in light of the flood of cases now coming before the Ombudsman. My question is this, is it time to reprioritize and put maladministration cases front and center of monitoring officers' attention? After all, Having effective corporate influence is surely what being a monitoring officer is all about. If you would like to share your own experiences of advising upon ombudsman investigations, go to our forum page and let us have your views. Is levelling up still a key policy or not? Is it to be as originally envisaged? or is something else happening to change the focus or the detail or both? There was a parliamentary debate recently on the levelling up and regeneration bill and the LGA issued a detailed briefing on the concerns that they still have. Some of their key messages were these. First, on devolution. The LGA support the government's approach to devolution and its commitment to offer all of England the opportunity to benefit from a devolution deal by 2030. Second, the new intervention powers. The LGA are deeply concerned 
that the proposed risk mitigation measures in Clause 71 of the Bill potentially give the Secretary of State significant and unwelcome powers to intervene in a local authority. There is a danger that the formula-based approach outlined in the Bill could impact more widely than is intended. Now, the LGA urged the government to consult much further on these proposals. Advice from the sector could assist the government in preserving the key concept of prudential borrowing, while ensuring that the new arrangements address genuine concerns that the government have. The LGA therefore supported an amendment which would ensure that the government undertakes a consultation with all local authorities before making regulations in relation to the new intervention proposals. Next, the LGA supports the government's plans to introduce a permanent pavement licensing regime. They welcomed the close engagement with departmental officials to make improvements to the temporary regime that currently exists, and note that this bill increases pavement license fees, provides a longer consultation and determination period, and improved enforcement powers for councils. However, the LGA want to go further and are supporting amendments to the bill to create a specific offence for pavement license breaches to enable councils to take effective enforcement action. Next, Clause 74 sets out conditions for councils when changing street names. The LGA is seeking to remove the current clauses in the bill and replace them with new clauses which allow for regulations to be led requiring local authorities to undertake a referendum in order to change street names, including setting out the precise detail for how those referenda should be run. Now, the LGA proposes alternative clauses which would require local authorities to consult residents and the wider community before making changes to street names and have regard to the outcomes, allowing flexibility over the method adopted to consult. Now, these are just some of the issues of concern that the LGA have raised with the government. LLG will keep you posted on all further developments in relation to the bill as it progresses through Parliament. I want to talk now about climate change and the law. Are you someone who thinks it has no real bearing on what you do as a local government lawyer? Well, think again and take a close look at a recent case involving the government and Friends of the Earth. The government has said it will not now appeal the High Court ruling that found its net zero strategy to be unlawful. In the case of the Crown on the application of Friends of the Earth against the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Mr Justice Holgate ruled that the policy was unlawful because the minister involved in the decision was not given the necessary information needed in order to make the decision lawfully. The judge who handed down the decision in July found that the Secretary of State's net zero strategy was in breach of section 13 and 14 of the Climate Change Act 2008. The government had initially applied for permission to appeal the ruling, but had subsequently decided to abandon its pursuit. It sent a letter to the court and to the parties involved in the case confirming its decision. Friends of the Earth said that ministers must now focus their energies on the action and detailed policies needed to address the climate crisis. They criticised the existing strategy, highlighting a warning from the Climate Change Committee that there are only credible policies to achieve 39% of the emission cuts needed. Now, the significance of this case goes well beyond the circumstances of this particular case. It tells us that climate change is a significant material consideration in the setting and application of policy. But if you advise on governance, on procurement, on environmental and planning matters, climate change should be at the forefront of how you advise on the law, period. Week, the master of the roles, Sir Geoffrey Voss, called on lawyers and judges at all levels to think more about how their conversation may be inadvertently excluding people in the sector. Sir Geoffrey Voss told a legal services board conference that women and people from different ethnic and social backgrounds are not always made to feel welcome and included in the legal working environment. Certain groups felt excluded partly because they cannot relate to what colleagues are talking about, he said, stressing that it was everyone's responsibility to ensure that social situations 
are tailored to suit everyone. A pervasive problem is what he called accidental or unthinking exclusion, Voss told the reshaping legal services event. Lawyers tend, he said, to like the sound of their own voices and fail to see themselves as others see them. Well, I never. This is problematic for inclusion. It is a characteristic in white men, and dare I say it, older white men. Voss said that women and people from diverse backgrounds were more likely to have caring responsibilities and less time to socialize with colleagues. Given that they may feel excluded from the social side of working in a legal environment, it was even more important to ensure inclusion within the workplace. Voss gave examples of the kind of inappropriate conversations that might have an adverse impact upon inclusion. Talk of Oxford University, talk of cricket, and the latest operatic production at Covent Garden. Well, I don't recall much of that when I worked at Doncaster or Gateshead, but seriously, I do see his point. Language and the nature of casual conversation is often the first point at which a sense of exclusion can begin. For Voss, the key to all of this lies in effective training and confronting these issues in a direct manner. He said, my own experience is that there is no substitute for face-to-face -face training and confronting the issues. He said, you only address those problems if someone says, do you know how you behave in a particular situation? You could behave better. Diversity is not just for the sake of it. It's not for some ethereal principle. It is better for our society if we include everyone. We agree entirely. We all know of colleagues who are not good at timekeeping, who are late for meetings, or late to arrive in the morning, or more likely, they don't keep their flexi records up to date. It's probably a standing joke in the office chit chat. No big deal, you might think. Well, think again. The Employment Appeal Tribunal recently held that a dismissal for persistent lateness was fair, even though in a number of instances, the employee had only been a couple of minutes late. The case of Tihani and the House of Commons Commission concerned a cleaner working in the House of Commons. The cleaning team had a strict time frame in which to complete their duties. Mr. Harney was taken through the usual process of warnings before being dismissed for being late by between two and 33 minutes on 50 occasions. An employment tribunal held that the dismissal was fair. Whilst on many occasions, Mr. Harney's lateness was a matter of only one or two minutes, the tribunal said that those occasions should not simply be disregarded. Employees should not only arrive at work on time, but be ready to start work from the time they are being paid. The employer does not have to prove to an employee that there has been actual damage arising from conduct of this kind. Persistent lateness can be highly disruptive for organizations, especially where the employee is in a time critical role. Now this decision highlights that provided the correct disciplinary procedure is followed, and the employee is given warnings and the opportunity to improve, employers can fairly dismiss for persistent lateness, even where the employee is quite often only a few minutes late. But on the other hand, in a world where flexible working is not only becoming the norm, but is being demanded by employees, those employers that require employees to work to the minute where there is room for more flexibility may be unlikely to justify dismissal at a tribunal. But the phrase time critical role set me thinking. I can think of many situations in local authorities where timeliness is super critical. Litigation lawyers in particular come to mind and lawyers working as part of project teams in a strictly time bound environment. And of course, the committee meeting cycle does not permit much flexibility for getting things done within tight deadlines. And on that timely note, that's it for another edition of the podcast. You can read more on the items discussed today and many more besides by going to Bulletin 38, available now on the LLG website. So it's goodbye from me. Thank you for listening. Have a good week.